Uh, good morning. Uh, um, well, I think it is high time that you start thinking about your final paper. Let me just one more time uh, tell you what my expectation is. Uh, right, there are three major blocks uh, in the course. For each of the blocks, uh, there is a test. You have done two. Uh, one more will be done last uh, week of classes. Um, um, I mean, the idea of the paper is that you do a little more ambitious work, right? You link um, uh, two of the blocks to, to each other. So you compare uh, Hobbes' theory of human nature with uh, Durkheim's theory of human nature, uh, or Hobbes, Rousseau, and Durkheim, or something like this. Um, or um, uh, you look at the question of power in Hobbes, Nietzsche, and Weber, right? Uh, do two or three orders as such. Um, uh, I also highly recommend you that you um, uh, go what excites you the most. Uh, you pick a topic what you find exciting. If there was anything in this course that made you excited, write about it, right? And you can use uh, uh, earlier uh, essay topics, what you wrote up. That's no problem. Uh, that will be a new paper anyway, right? Because you have to link occasionally quite distant authors to each other. And talk to your discussion section leader or send an email. It can be very short, uh, just to make sure that you are on the right, um, uh, uh, right trajectory, right? And probably your discussion section leader will give you just a two-sentence response to say, yes, this seems to be fine, or no, you are taking on too many, and there are too many authors, why don't you do only two or three rather than five, what you're suggesting? <coughs> or, well, uh, you know, you, you should be a little more ambitious, right? This is the kind of feedback you should expect. And otherwise, and let me also say that one more time, uh, uh, you know us in this course. Uh, we want to make these abstract theories relevant to your life. So therefore, don't shy away. If you have opinions, if you can reflect how uh, uh, the course uh, um, uh, helped or did not help to understand yourself in society, do so, right? Um, uh, but I think uh, you really should... Uh, uh, talk to your discussion section leader or email, at least on email um, uh, before you leave for the vacation because um, uh, I, I want when you, uh, you are tired of Turkey or you had enough uh, a beer and watching uh, uh, football and uh, then you want to have fun, then you can start uh, working on your final paper, right? Uh, you don't leave it to the very end, right? But you can use... Uh, your spare time uh, during Thanksgiving's break uh, to get started on it. And that's not a big deal. You know, we want you to do something like six or uh, uh, at most eight pages, but more like six pages. This is not really much more than, you know, the usual uh, test um, essays. Okay. Um, is that all clear? Any, any question about this? Anyway, we will try to be as unbureaucratic about this as uh, in a bureaucratic organization you can be, all right? As you have seen in this course, we were trying to break the rules of bureaucracy and hopefully not at the expense of efficiency. All right, uh, so this is Weber, on, uh, Weber theory on class um, and... Um, this is probably Weber, next to Marx, is the most influential theorist of class. Uh, uh, and they are also on a collision course with each other. A uh, collision course in many ways. Uh, uh, I will elaborate on this, but just to foreshadow, uh, 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 there are really two fun three fundamentally important issues where uh, Marx and Weber disagree. Marx, as you recall, identified classes in property relationship. Right? The class dichotomy was between those who own capital and those who own only their labor power. Uh, Weber, in contrast, defines classes 
on the marketplace uh, as market situations. So the relationship, uh, uh, this will be more complicated, but then the class relationship is between the employer and the employee. It is between the manager and the worker and not the owner, right? And uh, uh, the possessor of labor power. Then Marx also said, well, uh, all history of humankind is history of class struggles. So Weber has a, uh, Marx has a theory of class which is overarching uh, the whole human history. Weber is very specific about this. Class is a modern phenomenon. Class is only emerged with the emergence of the market economy, market capitalism. Before capitalism, there are, they are not, the stratification system is not based on class, but it is based on status. And we will talk about uh, the notion of status a great deal. And finally, there is a third important political difference. Marx believed that class struggle gets more intense over time and therefore the subordinated class eventually will revolt and overthrow capitalism. Weber believed uh, that uh, the, in the opposite, uh, uh, class struggle is the most intense in early stages, rough stages of capitalism, and as capitalism becomes consolidated and bureaucratized, class struggle is actually reduced. Um, so these are the three fundamental differences. And this is the outline of the presentation uh, today. Uh, so first of all, I want to talk about the usual interpretation of Weber, and I want to challenge this interpretation. Uh, if you ever took a course in which Weber's theory of class was discussed, you usually had the interpretation what I present now. If you go on the internet and you find what Weber got about class, this is what you get. I disagree with it. Um, and uh, I will try to show you why this is the wrong approach. Uh, the usual interpretation goes back to a British sociologist, uh, um, uh, Runciman, who wrote about this already in the 1960s. Um, uh, uh, he's still active, actually. And uh, he interpreted Weber as uh, um, offering uh, uh, a theory of social inequality uh, in three dimensions. Uh, again, go on the internet, 90% of um, uh, internet posting on Weber and class will give you this view. What are those three dimensions? Status or prestige is one dimension. The second is class, uh, usually defined by income or wealth. And the third dimension is power. Um, and therefore, if you look at stratification in society, um, people can be unequal in any of these, uh, uh, can be privileged in any of these dimensions or all of the dimensions as such. Uh, this uh, uh, Ranciman, uh, 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 conceptualization of uh, Weber's theory of the class was extremely um, influential on empirical research. There was a lot of empirical survey research carried out which was trying to measure uh, how people fare in these three dimensions. Um, Gerhard Lenski, uh, who was professor, now emeritus professor, was professor at the University of um, uh, North Carolina. Uh, uh, created the theory of status inconsistency. Um, the idea was that uh, uh, people actually can be high in one, one of these dimensions and relatively low in another dimension. So, for instance, uh, uh, you are a professor of sociology, uh, then, you know, your prestige is uh, sort of reasonable, you know, probably somewhat higher uh, than uh, average. Um, if you are a professor at Yale, you know, it's uh, sort of even a little higher than average, you know, uh, uh, substantially higher than average. Well, in terms of uh, income, you know, if you are a professor of sociology, you will be, again, only slightly higher um, than average, uh, will not be very high. In terms of power, well, you will be very low in the power hierarchy. Uh, 
um, at least in the United States, right? Nobody listens what sociologists are saying, you know. Students do have to, right? And occasionally they have to take a sociology course. That's the only power, really, a professor exercises. Well, um, uh, if you are um, uh, a Supreme Court justice, uh, then uh, your prestige is extremely high. You are on the top of the prestige hierarchy, at least in the United States. If you are asking who, are, what, who is the most prestigious occupation in the United States in surveys, people will say to be a Supreme Court justice, right? A serve on the Supreme Court. Well, um, in terms of income, the Supreme Court justices probably don't do all that well. Uh, they probably do about as university professors do, uh, right? Uh, people in public service usually don't do all that well. Uh, I think probably a governor of a state is not earning more than a university professor. Uh, but in terms of power, uh, they will be very high, right? Uh, Supreme Court justices are very high. Occasionally, they can even appoint right, the president of the United States, uh, if I may crack this joke, right? Anyway, they are very powerful. Well, um, if you think about a mafioso, the prestige of a godfather, except in the mafia, will be very low, right? You regard it as criminal. Um, in terms of income, you'll be on the very top, right? In terms of power, well, we'll have some power, but mainly in the mafia, not really nationally. You see what they are getting at. So, therefore, you can measure uh, uh, status, class, and power as three dimensions. And this is very helpful to understand whether um, uh, 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 the social status is crystallized. Uh, people who have high prestige also have high incomes and high power. And uh, uh, let's say somebody who is sweeping the floor, right, um, uh, 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 will have very low prestige, very low income, and no power at all. Right? Uh, so that is a useful way how to stratify society for upper upper class to lower lower class. That is the way how Weber usually has been used. Now, I will challenge this. Uh, 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 I'm, I don't think I'm the only one who does challenges. Anthony Giddens, I think that's very close to what I'm describing, though probably he doesn't stick his neck out as much as I do. Um, I, my fundamental argument is that Weber's distinction between class and status is a historical distinction. And this is not accidental that this is an English-speaking person, Runciman, who reads the notion of status the way how he reads it. Because if you uh, know a little German, and you try to read Weber in German, you know that the word status is actually uh, translated from the word Stand. And Stand, well, it can be translated into English as status, but it's a not very good translation of the word. The better translation is estate. Now, if you would translate Stand as estate, it would become obvious that what Weber is trying to suggest, that there is something archaic about status stratification as distinct from class stratification, which is a modern phenomenon, right? So this will be one of the major points that I'm trying to make, and we'll try to show this uh, um, uh, uh, from Weber's text. Then uh, the question is, where is the third dimension, right? As I said, uh, status and class are historical categories, but where is power? Uh, and when I was uh, working on one of my books, uh, I was very much attracted to Runciman's idea and tried to interpret Weber this way. And uh, in fact, it appealed to me a great deal to use power as an independent uh, dimension um, of uh, 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 the class position. Uh, I was trying to understand the social structure of communist societies and their power appeared to be an independent dimension. So I was looking into the Weber text and I read cover to cover economy and society a couple of times. 
and I could not find the third dimension. Read it. It is not there. Uh, um, uh, so, uh, trying to understand what Weber is getting at, I, you know, I came to the conclusion that for Weber, uh, power is the dependent variable. But he wants to explain where power comes from and whether power exercised is exercised on the basis of class privileges or whether it is a status type of, uh, uh, or a state type of power which is exercised in society. And this is very consistent. What you already know about Max Weber, right? Type of authorities, where power comes from, what legitimates power, right? Tradition or legal rational authority, right? Uh, class stratification corresponds to societies based on legal rational authority. Status stratification corresponds to traditional authority. All right? Well, I will uh, elaborate a, a, a little on this. We'll qualify this somewhat, primarily because Weber, like uh, in his uh, uh, types of, of authority as well, uh, has two balls in the air at the same time. He has a macro theory, right, of historical variations of stratification. For him, transition from, and, you know, uh, a traditional society in modern rational societies is a transition from a state type of stratification to class stratification. But Weber also uh, has a micro theory. He also said, okay, the society today is primarily class stratified, but I can identify status power in modern societies as well, just exactly as he does with the types of authority. Yes, the United States today is legal rational authority, but I can spot elements of traditional authority or charismatic authority operating within legal rational authority. Since it is dominantly legal rational authority, it will be secondary. Law will make a, a difference. But traditional, tradition in this society, in this very America today, does make a difference, right? It is consequential. Where you are in society, traditional authority is consequential, right? Uh, we are all equal before the law. But in practice, where we end up has a lot to do with tradition, traditional prejudices, tra the traditional way how power operates. The same goes for, he, he brings back the idea of status. This is why I said translating stand as status is not completely wrong. It only gets uh, the, the footnote in the Weber concept, right? The footnote is, uh, stand is primarily a historical um, concept for past traditional societies. But by the way, this is the footnote, even in contemporary so so society, in class stratified societies, there is power occasionally exercised on the basis of uh, 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 status. Uh, well, and obviously, you know, the power which is exercised by a Supreme Court judge or the power exercised uh, uh, by uh, a university professor, the little one we have, that we may probably in some way try to change your mind, right? Which is an act of power. Or some would say even an act of coercive power, right? Uh, uh, Bourdieu called it symbolic violence, right? I violate your mind, you know, if I can penetrate your mind and put a new idea into your mind, right? This is an act of power. Well, uh, it's primarily done, or a great deal done, by status. Uh, that you say, well, this is a professor who has a PhD, must know it, right? Uh, then it is really, right, the reason why you start believing me has a lot to do with my status. Hopefully not only the status. Hopefully I can make a good argument and persuade you. But occasionally it's a mixture why you tend to believe me or disbelieve me, right? And the very fact of the status, what I, uh, what I am incumbent of, uh, has something to do, right? Uh, uh, of you uh, trying to believe your professors. 
So uh, 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 let me work on the notion how Weber defines classes. Um, and the most important issue is uh, the uniquely Weberian idea is that class has to be identified on the market. And then I will uh, also say a few words about class interest and how he, to what extent he's different from Marx in this respect. Uh, so class and market. Uh, now, here you have famous definitions. Uh, uh, he said, class situation is determined by market situation. Um, class situation is ultimately a market situation. And this is very important now, the, uh, as follows, right? The effects of naked possession, per se, is only the forerunner of real class formation. Slaves, he said, or you can say serfs, are not a class. They are rather a status quo. Now here you can see right, the historical uses of the distinction between class and status, right? Uh, and also the challenge to Marx. Uh, prop those who have property and deprived from property uh, do not constitute a class. And the fundamental argument for this is that in traditional societies, it is not really property which puts you into a high status position, you being in a high status position has the consequence that you are wealthy, right? So the king or the queen decides to give you nobility and gives you an estate, right? Uh, in capitalism, this works the other way around. In order to become a billionaire, right, you don't have to get the approval of the President of the United States. Simple enough. You go to Wall Street, you invest your money smartly, you start with $1,000, and in no time you have a billion, right? If you invested it in a smart way. And then you are in the class, right, of billionaires, right? Uh, so, here, it is your, your property uh, uh, and your activity on the marketplace, which en helps you to enter the class, right? Uh, in the aristocracy, it was a legal act, right? Uh, a political act by a king or a queen, which made you nobility, made you a lord, and then, as a consequence, you became wealthy, right? It's also interesting, by the way, that when, if you lost your wealth, there were some poor noble people. You still repay, re, retained your uh, uh, status, estate privileges. So if you were nobility in most societies, for instance, you did not have to pay taxes. Now, if you lost all of your estate, you know, because you gambled, for instance, right? Uh, you wanted to go to Monte Carlo where you, you gambled everything away. Then you became very poor. You were still noble and you still did not have to, right, uh, pay taxes. Uh, your sta uh, status privileges remained. The opposite, right, uh, in capitalism. You start uh, poorly investing your money and you lose your money on the stock market, you cease to be a capitalist, right? Then you will have to seek to find a job, right? And since you lost all of your money, you probably will not find a very good job because who wants to hire a loser, right? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, he, this is also a very important citation from Weber. He said, you know, the, the class position really means that people have common life chances, right? Uh, if uh, you are located differently, there are... Positively and negatively, this is the Weberian point, positively and negatively privileged positions on the marketplace. And if you are negatively privileged, privileged in the marketplace, your life chances are not very good, right? If you are positively privileged uh, in the marketplace, then your life chances are great. You guys in this room are all very positively privileged, right? Because you are getting a Yale degree, and, you know, probably a Harvard degree would be even better for you. Uh, don't tell Rick Levine that I said that in class, right? Um, but uh, um, uh, 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 this is, you know, about the best degree what you can have. 
So you are extremely well positioned on the labor market, right? Your life chances are great, right? You have to make a lot of mistakes to screw this one, right? Yeah, right? You are on the right trajectory. Um, uh, if you are in a community college, right, or you are a high school dropout, then your life chances on the labor market will be lousy, right? Um, um, especially you are poor, you are African-American, you dropped out of high school. Uh, well, uh, your chances that, you know, you will end up in jail uh, uh, before you turn 30 is, I think, 70%. Uh, so, right, this is life chances, right, which that, that in this case, of course, it is not only class, right? There is a special type of status group, right? Race, it also plays a role, right? And um, in your deteriorating life chances. Now, let me also say that Weber actually suggests that you can think of classes on every single market situation. Uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, some people, and uh, myself in my work, have been uh, writing about housing classes. The rif differences between the owner of a house and the tenant uh, who rents this house is a class relationship, can be interpreted as a class relationship. The landlords, very often by the tenants, are seen as bloodsuckers, right? Because they charge too high rent and they do not maintain your unit properly, you know? When you call them and, and you say that the water is dipping and I need a plumber, they will find excuses why they do not fix, you know, your uh, 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 water or why they do not fix your heating, right? So they are bloodsuckers, right? Uh, and as a tenant, you are in a negatively privileged class position. That's true. But on the other hand, Weber is quite clear that there are two important market positions which fundamentally define your class position. Um, and uh, uh, these are uh, the labor market and, in fact, the capital market. Uh, we'll define where, uh, uh, whether you are have good life chances or poor life chances. And all other positions on other markets will be a consequence of your position primarily on the labor market or on capital markets. Now, this actually brings uh, Weber and Marx a little closer than it appeared for the first time, right? Because, uh, as we will see, Weber does acknowledge that if there is a market economy, Differences in property are very important to creating um, uh, class positions, but unlike Marx, he emphasizes this is only the case if there is a market economy in place. Now, just very briefly about class interests and class action. And here he said, well, the statement by a talented author, he doesn't tell us who that author is, I assume it must be Karl Marx, that the individual may be in error concerning his interest, but the class is infallible about its interest, is false and pseudoscientific. So he said, well, uh, the classes are actually not communities, right? A community may have a kind of collective understanding. The you belong to a class uh, uh, just because of your position of the labor market. And you actually, here he uh, subscribes to Adam Smith, right? Uh, uh, class members are individuals acting out of self-interest and not acting out of collective interest. But they are in a similar position, and therefore they have common class interests. And surprise, surprise, occasionally they will act the same way, right? because they have a collective interest, but not as a community, but uh, as rationally acting individuals determined by their rational actions right, on the marketplace. Uh, and therefore, he said, well, classes will really exist. I, I, well, how can I tell that the classes really exist? I can tell if I see classes acting. Class is materialized in action, right? Because I speculatively cannot make any class distinction, but people will make distinctions for classes by acting 
upon their class interest. Now, let's go on to the question of status groups. What are status groups? And, uh, well, I briefly want to identify who status groups are, what status privileges are, and then uh, status stratification um, uh, and the caste and the question of ethnicity in Weber. So what is a status group? Well, unlike classes, uh, status group or stände, this is the plural of the word stand, are nominally groups. Um, uh, status groups means that you belong to a group, right? And you have a high esteem and you have a solidarity within the group. You have an honor, a certain honor is attributed to you when you are in a status group, right? You are initiated, right, into becoming a nobleman by an act of the king or the queen. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, in order to get a university degree, you are initiated, right, into a status group, in a way to earn a university degree, a bachelor's degree, a PhD, is entering in some ways as a status group. It's not accidental that we wear these funny, you know, medieval robes on those ceremonies where uh, the degree is conferred on you. And many professions which require formal university training act as a status group. Uh, like the doctors constitute, right, um, a status group, like uh, uh, in some ways, university professors uh, uh, constitute a status group, lawyers constitute a, a status group, and they somehow control ethics and entrance into the law profession, right? Um, uh, there you have to pass a board exam if you want to become a lawyer, right? And in fact, states will make, you know, in California, if you want to move to California, you want to get a law degree and you want to move to California, you will sweat blood, right, to pass the board exam. If you want to go to South Dakota, you will easily pass the board exam because there are not many lawyers who want to be lawyers in South Dakota, but there are many lawyers who want to be lawyers in San Francisco. And therefore, the board... California board will be much stricter than the South Dakota board. The same goes for uh, medical exams, right? It will be, um, again, you have to pass exams uh, um, uh, and it will be different depending on the labor market condition. And it's very important. The status honor is uh, expressed with specific lifestyle. The way how you dress, the way how you eat, uh, the way how you behave uh, um, is constituting what is status quo. Traditionally, right, noblemen could wear arms, non-nobles couldn't. Um, um, and, uh, uh, well, if you are a year professor, you will uh, J. Press, right? Uh, 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 I mean, not everybody does, but, you know, it's, you, you can tell this is a year professor. You can see this is a J. A J. Press. Um, uh, um, quote. Uh, uh, so there are right uh, uh, lifestyles, uh, um, uh, but in a way, even in modern society, constitute uh, status groups. Even within st class stratification, you have this uniquely, you know, lifestyle-specific stuff. What you adapt in order to belong to this status group kind of subgroup within a class. So if you are a yuppie young urban professional, right? You get a nice job on Wall Street, you move to Manhattan, right? Then you rent out, right? Uh, or buy a condo somewhere in a Trump building, right? Then you want to be driven by a limo to your workplace. You will be reading Wall Street Journal and you will be going, right? And you will be uh, having croissant for the morning, right? And uh, you, you see what I'm getting at, right? Uh, you will be dressed in a certain way. People can tell, right? This person must be a broker, right? On Wall Street. There are these lifestyle characteristics, but put in a way, creates an almost status group. You, you, you know each other, right? 
you recognize each other, right? There are places where you hang together, right? There are yuppie places. You look outside and you know, this is a yuppie bra filled with yuppies. This is the lifestyle by which you establish. There are also, of course, status privileges, uh, um, uh, which is uh, ideal and material goods, which is the consequence of you being in that status group uh, rather <coughs> uh, than uh, the source uh, uh, of it. Uh, and there are also uh, specific special employment opportunities if you belong to a status group, and it's being controlled this way. I mean, medical profession is a very good example, and it's, it's being actually uh, debated and questions to why on earth do we need a system in which people have to have registered, you know, do have to have a, a medical degree in order to practice medicine, right? Uh, why on earth people do have to have a law degree in order to appear in court and defend somebody in court, right? These are kind of status group uh, 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 barriers uh, to enter uh, uh, this system. Well, uh, the market, on the other hand, knows no personal distinction. Uh, on the market, it matters whether you are successful or you are a failure, right? And therefore, if you have this status group kind of privileges, this is a limitation on the functioning of the market, right? And therefore, stronger the status groups are, it can be a hindrance of free development of a market economy. And now an idea about uh, uh, class and ethnicity. He said if uh, the boundaries between uh, uh, status groups are particularly sharply drawn, in that case uh, we can talk about castes. The caste differences occur, for instance, when there are prohibitions to intermarry between castes. Uh, lower castes are usually seen as polluted, as dirty. You even cannot touch them. Or if you, ha you did touch a low-class person, let's say in Indian culture, you have to go some purification procedures. Uh, right? Um, and he said uh, status group segregation goes into caste that transforms uh, a horizontal coexistence of uh, ethnically segregated groups into a vertical social system. Uh, uh, this is also very important, right? His notion of ethnicity. It's a very, uh, very innovative idea in writing this around 1920 about this. Right? The, the differences are held to be ethnic uh, on, based on the belief that it has something to do with blood relations, right? He does not believe, right, that ethnic differences really have anything to do with blood relations. You have ethnic or racial differences when there is a common belief that blood relations do matter and are socially consequential. He doesn't believe it is. Now, class and status compared. Uh, um, uh, I am sort of running out of time, don't want to... Um, uh, operate on, uh, to do too much on this. Uh, uh, the, the point is, right, that uh, 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 um, there is some kind of stability uh, in uh, status stratification. Uh, uh, class stratification uh, is dynamic and, and conflictuous. Uh, this is where his idea will come from that in fact uh, uh, um, uh, uh, class relationships are not becoming more antagonistic over time, but it's becoming less antagonistic over time. But the point is, as you can see, that the main point is that there are two basic stratification systems, one based uh, on uh, uh, status uh, or stand, and the other one is uh, on class stratification historical difference, but there is also a subtype of stratification in a class stratified society based on status differences. So what are, he makes a distinction between different types of classes. Let me just briefly rush through of it. He does not negate that there is actually a class based on property. 
there is actually property differences can be very substantial as long as they are operating in a marketplace. If, you know, your property can be sold or bought, which was not the case under feudalism, and if there is a labor market which complements capital markets, then differences in capital markets is the source of uh, uh, differences. Uh, um, um, uh, but the most important di distinction is what he calls commercial classes. And commercial classes are based, right, on the market situation, um, and particularly, especially based on labor markets. And therefore, the basic class distinction for labor in modern society is between management and employees, rather than owners of capital and owners of labor power, unlike Marx. And that, I think, is a, a very insightful argument, at least an important uh, um, uh, qualification on Marx, or probably uh, a useful re replacement of Marx with a, a better fitting theory uh, to understand modern societies. Okay, uh, and then there are, he, he introduces the notion of social classes. There is a third type of class in modern society, which is social class. And what is social class? People are in a social class situation when individual and generational mobility is easy and typical within that class. Uh, and then he said, well, what are social classes? And interestingly, he said, well, these examples are working class is a social class. The petty bourgeoisie is a social class. <coughs> the basic argument here is that, it, you know, working class is not a commercial class. Working class well, he's writing 19th century, but it's, this, it's still to some extent true uh, in the United States today, probably the least so in the U.S. Uh, than in other uh, economies. Then, you know, um, uh, being working class was certainly very true in Europe, um, uh, uh, probably less so now, but even during the second half of the 20th century in, in Italy and France, there was a very strong working class consciousness. You were proud of being working class. In the US, the term working class hardly exists, right? We are talking about the working people rather than a working class. But in Italy or in France, there was a very strong identity of being a working class, very clearly identifiable lifestyle features. Not that if, in fact, in the United States, you can't really, you usually can tell, I think, with 90% um, certainty. If you walk into a tavern, right, um, <coughs> or in, a, in a, you know, who, who is a manual worker and who is not a manual worker, right? The way how people behave, the way how people dress, uh, gives you a very good clue. And you know, in France or in Italy, to some extent, even in the United States, uh, you know, working class will say, well. It was good enough for me to be plumber. Why on earth my son doesn't want to be a plumber and continue my business as a plumber? That's good enough, right? If it was good enough for me, it should be good enough for my son. Another, you know, how he understands uh, um, social class as, a, as distinct from economic class. You, you become a social class when you will say, well, you are in working class and uh, uh, your daughter uh, is... Uh, dating uh, a lawyer. Then he will say, can't you find a decent working class guy? Uh, you want to date with this egghead? Again, in the United States, it is much less common, right? There is many more marital mobility across class lines, much less so uh, in Italy uh, or, uh, or in France, even, even today. Uh, anyway, this is social class. But as you can see, social class, in a way, bringing back the idea of status groups. It is a modern version of status group, but is being constituted as a social class because it has a lot to do with lifestyles, values, culture, right? And typical patterns of mobility and aspirations um, uh, as such. Well, that's about it. Thank you very much.